and welcome to the Nexus Nextcast. On today's episode, we have returning cosmological consultant, Jeff Harmon. Another in our series of what is going on now and what do the cosmological heavens and the energy say about what's going on today and how that may unfold in the future. Now, as you know, in the previous episodes we've had Jeff on, we've had some very interesting points in which what's going on is being foretold and given some type of indication in the heavens. And for those of you that don't really understand or look at this astrological aspect of the way in which energy and information is provided from the heavens and still have some questions about it, I highly recommend you go back and listen to our previous episodes and look at what was defined and divined by Mr. Harmon through his charts and understanding of the cosmological constants and being able to say, here's what's going on and here's what may unfold and see just how accurate that is. Because at the end of the day, you can't deny the evidence. You can't deny when something is being given as proof or given as data and then later on proves to be proof of that which we thought we might be looking at and that which may unfold. So let's get right into it. In today's episode, let's talk about all this crazy stuff that's going on, Jeff. I mean, I, I look at the data. I've, I've gotten to the point to where I've become, uh, I'm defining myself as an objective observationalist, mm -hmm. one that looks at everything as objectively as possible and takes it for what it is, for the data that it, that it contains and the data that surrounds it so that you can actually look at something and, and say, well, I'm not sure what that means, but I will consider the data and I will look at it and say, hmm, is this something that will have, does have re relevance now and something that may have relevance going forward? So when we look at the stuff that is going on, let's start with uh, the impeachment inquiry mm. yeah. as That's they're the defining one. it. Yeah. What do the uh, what do the heavens and the stars and the cosmological consciousness say about these particular events today? Well, it, it's interesting because uh, I always say the American legal system is the finest system money can buy, and and it really <laughs> is. <clears throat> um, I mean, I look at how many clients I've talked to over the years that have just been destroyed. I've had problems in the past with patents and things, and it's just amazing how devastating legal issues can be. So I looked yesterday, the impeachment hearing started. In fact, I'm on record on your show, uh, I think it was about a month or two ago. Back where, in uh, September 24th, I believe. It was, it was something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had said, I don't think this is going to get legs to really ever remove him from office. I don't think it's going anywhere. So yesterday when the impeachment hearing started, <clears throat> excuse me, I did the same thing. I, I said, okay, well, let's see what happens because Schiff came out with, you know, he trotted out uh, Taylor and Kent and I thought, okay, this is interesting. And then the rebuttal came from the Republicans. Um, so I cast the chart and I said, you know, is Trump really going to get impeached? Is he going to be removed from office? And I'd have to say the, uh, the interrogation astrology stands and literally I would say, this is dead on arrival the minute it hits the Senate, and it looks like not only is, you see, the 10th house in interrogation astrology is always the, uh, the president. So here, I'll share, share this with you. In fact, mm -hmm. this is actually the, uh, the chart right here. You can see right here, I just said, will Trump be removed from office? So this is the chart right here. So the Lord of the 10th is Donald Trump because the president is always the 10th house. So what is the Lord of the 10th? Venus. Well, Venus is going to a conjunction of Jupiter. Certainly doesn't look like he's getting removed from office to me. You know, it's kind of like Elwood said to, or Jake said to Elwood and the Blues Brothers, Elwood this doesn't look like an impeachment success to me. So I don't know if you remember that line in the Blues oh, Brothers, yeah. but, but I love that when they're spinning around in the cop car. Anyways, <laughs> um, it, uh, I, I have to say, uh, when I look at this chart, it looks like a lot of mudslinging, a lot of much to do about nothing. The interesting thing, it's, and this, you and I were talking about this before the show, um, 
what's going to come to light here is I think Barr, Horowitz, and particularly Durham, I think there's going to be not only criminal referrals, but I think there's going to be criminal indictments. And what's very interesting is Pelosi, Romney, and Mr. Biden have all their children on the board in Ukraine. So Ukraine's going to become this, I think, um, dumpster full of roaches that's going to come out and we're going to see all kinds of stuff happen. I, I still, and I, I've said this for a while, it's taking a long time because I'm sure there's every legal obstruction and tactic and, and uh, you know, banana peel they can throw in the path. But eventually I, I think we're going to see some serious trouble for the other side. And I used the words on your show a long time ago that punching Trump is like punching Jello. You know, everyone hearing this is going to go, oh, well, wait a minute, Jeff's a Republican. He loves Trump. I actually do like Trump from his chart. A lot of people hate him, and I'm going to get hate mail for saying that. But uh, yes, he's abrasive. Yes, he's irritating to a lot of people. Um, but effective, the chart shows he is. In fact, I spent a lot of time looking at Trump's chart before I got on your show this morning. And this boy, I don't think he's going to get stopped. And I think he's going to win the election, even though it's looking like an aha moment for the Democrats with this. I think it's going to dry up and boomerang back. It, it's going to be the, like the, the torpedo in the movie Red October that comes back and blows them up. I, I really do. I, I, I think um, uh, The Hunt for the Red October, if you remember that movie. Oh, um, I love that movie. And Sean yeah. Connery. And I think that's actually one of Alec Baldwin's better movies. It, it is. You know, when it's he was younger. Movie. But, you know, to your point there, one of the things that I've noticed <clears> in the narrative that's going on, in this curated narrative that is going on across the political discourse, that is yeah. then, you know, just pushed out through the societal discourse. And there's a lot of intercourse in the discourse that mm. people aren't paying attention to that, but they're actually engaged in. And that you is watch that intercourse in the discourse. That's right. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that's happening is there, there, there is this new, uh, they, they keep trying to massage the way the words and use different words to try to deflect, but at the same time, inject a different opinion. And, sure. and all of it is, seems to be, especially this impeachment process seems to be a matter of, differing opinions about whether quid pro quo, bribery, extortion, I mean, all these different, they keep changing the narrative and, uh, and trying to deflect while at the same time injecting some new idea or new reason for sure. the course that they're taking. But one of the words that I heard, and, and one of the excuses is people are saying, well, what Trump is doing is not normal. No, it's not. And, He's and not you, normal. And when you think about He's it. He's unconventional. Well, that's and when you is. think about it, that's one of the reasons he was elected. The normal and, and the way in which the curated narrative has been put together for the last several decades, that normal is what he is defying. And he's defying it in a way that is very authentic. You yep. never have to worry about, and this is one of the other interesting things, people get into this whole aspect of, they, they try to read Trump's mind. Well, he intended this, or he meant that, or right. he was thinking this. And it's like, well, when did all of you people become mind readers? Well, at the end of the day, his normal is being a businessman with a very strong, as your charts have indicated, he's got a very strong, authentic personality, almost an emperor type. Is that not correct? Oh, yeah. When I look at Trump's Vedic chart, this is his Vedic astrology. And I mean, this guy, I, I, well, I'm sorry, that's the U.S. Sibley chart. There is Donald Trump's chart right there. <clears throat> when I look at his chart, I, I have to say, yeah, this guy, he's going to be very abrasive. He's almost militant-like, very diplomatic, even though people will say he's not a great orator, and he's not as polished of, of an orator as, as most presidents have been, clearly. But I can tell you one thing, this guy's tough. He's kind of like patent in a way. There's a lot of analogies to him. He's got, Mar he's got what we call a Raj Yoga Mars in the Ascendant, which in plain English means the guy's just got a tremendous amount of drive. 
what is, I think, the most telling is the fixed star on the ascendant. That's what you were just mentioning. Now, Western mm -hmm. astrologers are, are going to see that as regulus, but in the Vedic astrology, <clears throat> there's an old codex that describes that as, again, a crown laying on a throne being doned by the king who sits in it. And, and that's Trump. Love him or hate him. He is who he is. He, he, uh, he's always going to be who he is. And I think that's one of the refreshing things about Trump is that you at least know where he's at. If you, if you like him, great. If you don't, at least you know where he's at. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's no slick veneer over the top that most politicians have. And I think that's what people can't relate to. He's, he's more of an entertainer than he is a politician, and he's a businessman. Well, wouldn't that speak to the, dis in, in the disconnect that's going on in the political class? They're the ones that aren't used to it, but he's resonating with Joe Sixpack because Joe Sixpack, or the, you know, the rest of us out here, the plebes, if you will, we're the ones that can relate to the straight, authentic, simplistic talk that he uses. And I think that what's happening is the political, you know, we're seeing this with the impeachment uh, inquiry yesterday. Uh, I guess it was Taylor and Kent uh, were the two right. main Those are the two stars. Guys right. they and, it and out, these yeah. guys, these guys, it sounded like there were, they were, and they're definitely career, uh, not necessarily politicians, but career um, diplomats and people who have been around for a long time and been involved through several administrations and presidents, um, going through various iterations of different policy. And it sounded like they were squabbling about the fact that two things. One, they, there was a, a divergence from the norm of the way in which the Ukrainian yeah, policy yeah. And, and the uh, Eastern European policy was being redefined by the president, which, by the way, is his prerogative and his job. And one of his sole responsibilities as it relates to foreign relations, right? right they keep right. skipping over that part. That's his job to do that. Their job is to carry it out. But it sounded like they were squabbling over or they were pissed off that they weren't listened to. And then the other aspect was this second right. channel of diplomacy that the president had done with bringing Giuliani in. And when you think about it, going back to your point about um, the way his chart is, uh, being someone that's very sure of themselves, very has, has a lot of power, has a lot of just straight ahead getting things oh, yeah. done. When yeah. you think about other um, luminaries, other leaders, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, um, the guy who ran Intel, all of these people, once they, you know, books were written about them and they got out of, even sometimes before they got out of their uh, particular positions, there was one characteristic across all these people. Basically, they were assholes. They went in and they said, <laughs> well, get your job driven. done. Yeah. <laughs> right. Here's how I want it done. And That's by the right. way, if you don't do it, I'm going to bring somebody else in to do it. Right. And sometimes there were dual paths of yep. sending off different teams or individuals to sure. get the same job done. Well, that's what Trump's doing. Yep. Well, he, he's very, uh, one of the things I like about Trump's astrology right now, uh, for him favorably, and I would tell you that he's got Jupiter transiting his moon. He's just got to sit back. I was a little disappointed in, in um, Giuliani. I mean, he could have come back a little bit with, hey, I, you know, we're not just investigating the Bidens, but the other things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting how kind of coy they're being. They're not really coming out with much right now. But I, I, I got to say, when I look at this, here's another indicator. When I look at the interrogation chart, notice the 10th house is the president, if you look at right here. So if, if I point here, well, my pointer there, there. So the opposition, see, the seventh from the 10th is anyone who would be his enemy. Enemies. And he's got Mars right up there. Mm -hmm. But Mars goes to an opposition of Uranus here very soon. Plain English, what does that mean? It's going to be a little bit longer than it should be. But I think, I really still think that there's going to be some heads rolling and there's going to be a lot of trouble coming up. And I think Trump is very well aware of that. You, you couldn't get a better chart for Trump's success in this with his signifactor, Venus, going to a conjunction of Jupiter in this chart. Plain English, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He, he doesn't get removed from office. Plain English. I mean, he just doesn't. He, he gets through. He gets by. It works out. And I think even more, 
Um, and this is, you know, to use his expression, I think he is going to drain the swamp. I, I really do. I think the swamp is going to have alligators running like hell out of it. It Does looks it like the swamp's me? about to catch on fire. Somebody's throwing some gasoline and oil in those uh, bogs. It, it, does it, it seems to me that the, that the swamp is, has some, and, and as clueless as they apparently are, because I got to say, that going after Trump the way that they have been, I mean, they've been at it for over three years now. Um, everything, yeah, they that they, everything they keep bringing up just keeps, they, they make a big deal about it. This is the one. Uh, this is what's going to finally bring him down. Uh, sure. and, and when they have on record their own positions and thoughts about, you know, the, the, like the apparently the lawyer for this whistleblower, uh, whistleblower tweeted out that the coup has begun and it was within a week or two of his inauguration. And you go, well, okay. Oh, Did, yeah. That's a I mean. little bias there. Perhaps, all, perhaps? all this. Yeah. All right. So more they, they've been bias. at this for a long time. Long time. Trump yeah. has survived each and every one of them. Um, and now there is this movement afoot within what Barr has started with Durham and Horowitz. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, as apparently as blind and as clueless as, as the liberal progressive, I call them the neo-libs, because back when you and I were growing up, the liberal movement that we were a part of is nothing like it is today. Yeah, these these oh, people no. have turned Nothing. it 180 degrees into something yeah, that doesn't resemble it doesn't resemble sanity, let no, alone having a clue. But I think that there's they're even in their cluelessness and their their own um, instituted blindness of the foolishness that they're doing. I think they're smelling that gasoline that you're talking about. They yeah, know and the oil. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. What's what's about to happen is going to be oh, you, you, look at Biden. No, Biden no. looks like he's ready to jump off a bridge. I mean, well, he looks absolutely he, scared. I would say he's ready to fall off the bridge by yeah, not right, knowing he's on the bridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it all looks, I mean, again, for those that hate Trump, they're not going to want to hear what I'm about to say. I think he is uh, absolutely not going down. And the Democrats look like the only difference between them and the Titanic is the uh, the music was good when they went down. Uh, I, I'm just not seeing, I'm not seeing it. It, it looks like a total disruption. <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if we see indictments that are very substantial coming up real soon. And do you <coughs> think that, um, that, you know, the, from again, and, and I'm just trying to be an, an objective observationalist and looking at just the facts, just the data. When you look at Comey and Brennan and uh, what's he, a clapper, yep. uh, these guys were the ones that were, you know, in charge when, right. and, and this is one of the things that just blows my mind and how um, I don't know if it's a purposeful uh, willingness to not look or if it's just a complete ignorance as it relates to data. But all of this Russian interference started under Obama and these three clowns. Mm -hmm. Now, they were the ones that were in charge when they found <coughs> this stuff. They yep. were the ones that apparently allowed it to happen. And then you throw in, you know, Billary and the whole clown mm -hmm. show at the DNC and what they did to Sanders I, I think I mean, you look she's at this narrative, and you can't make this story up. Yep. For the the, in, not, the to me, it's it's almost the one half of it is incompetence, the other half of it is a willingness to be that um, uh, intentional at trying to really get somebody. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's all out in the open. It's you don't have to go into conspiracy theories. You don't have to look at trying to construct something to fit your own ideological narrative. These right. are just no. the facts. Now, how do you have a conversation with people that have taken those kind of facts and then curated a narrative around it that is in their favor and have any kind of conversation? It doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. No, that's, that's a tough one. Um, the only thing I can say is it looks to me like they're not, it's, it's dead on arrival when it hits the Senate. Not gonna. Yeah, I don't even. I, think, I don't even I don't think, think it's, it's gonna, gonna hit. The, I don't think. <clears> I think it's gonna be tough. 
Yeah, I, I think that yep. I think there's gonna there's gonna be so much obvious foolery that uh, once they get to a vote, to vote to continue to to move this to the Senate is going to be something that a lot of these Democrats uh, are going to say, I don't think I want to put my stamp on that. Yep. I, I said it before, and I'll say it again at the risk of uh, getting hate mail, but I think Trump is going to go through this election and win faster, even though, you know, it may, it may be whatever close or something, but I, I think he's going to win like a freight train going through a wet paper bag. I really do. I really do. Now, how does that play out? Uh, what are the, the, the heavens saying about how that plays out on the world stage? Because, you know, one of the parts of, the, of this curated uh, yep. crazy narrative coming out of the left is that, you know, the, we're not respected around the world like we were, or there, you know, the, all these leaders and these people hate Trump. I, I don't see it. I see more of the opposite, but yeah, do, yeah. do we see anything? Uh, what is the world reaction potentially going to be with Trump finally, well, you know, coming I, I through? Think- I think it's going to be a landslide, but. I do too. I think I think he's. That's why my analogy, like a freight train through a wet paper bag. I, I really think he's gonna just go, and love him or hate him, that's the way it's going to be. And I, 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 that's what the charts say. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though I don't believe it or not, actually believe in astrology or for that matter anything, I'm more of an objective observer. I, li- I like to look at this as almost science and say, okay, what does the chart say? A lot of times I see things in the chart that I don't even rationally agree with, but the chart ends up being right. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's astronomy. It, it literally is. It's interactive consciousness based on the astronomy. And I would say the, the thing I see on the world stage, to answer your question you just brought up, is this Saturn-Pluto conjunction is going to happen on January 12th. And everybody says, oh, that's going to be when it's over. I said, no, that's the trigger. That's the trigger. If you go back last century, it triggered World War I, really close to it. It always triggers economic upheavals. Uh, it, it certainly exacerbates weather. Um, and, and again, 9-11 happened under Saturn-Pluto opposition. The, the final Saturn-Pluto square in 2008 and 2009 is what caused the bank crash. Mm-hmm. I think we have this mounting tension in a number of areas, both in the Middle East. I, I've been saying I, I'm very concerned about the whole situation over there with Iran, Israel, Syria, Turkey, all that. It just, you know, it's, it's always been a hot box. I think it's going to continue to be. And, you know, this is the oldest trick in the book. The bankers back both sides, create a, a con- or they don't create a conflict. They wait till one happens. And then, you know, that's, that's the way it is. They make more mm-hmm in uh, three days of war and they make in 10 years of peace. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm worried about that in terms of what the charts indicate. The second thing is economics. I, I think we are at such a crisis. I've heard people that are much more knowledgeable than me confirm what the astrology is saying. And that is that they're saying they're hearing the banks used to level accounts um, or do a I forget what they call it. It's some bank, bank to venture issue that, that levels the accounts mm-hmm. uh, with the derivatives. There's a, something called the ICE, which is ICE as well, but it's the International Continental Exchange. There's other names of other things connected with the IMF that I'm hearing are at crisis point. They're literally leveling the banks on a regular basis, sometimes more than several times a day, just to keep mm-hmm. them solvent. Deutsche Bank sounds like it's ready to just crumble. Um, the European bank system has been like this for years. It's just gotten worse. And I hear China's in the same boat. Yeah, and, and there, there, that is one of the areas that I'd really like to get into. We're at the end of the first segment. Mm-hmm. Let's pick up um, on the second segment on what we see uh, globally, both uh, from an economic perspective, as mm-hmm. well as some of the tensions that are going on with some of these, uh, the various countries that, that we're working uh, either with or against or trying to, you know, in, in the Trumpian way, trying to put some kind of deal together. Because yeah. Yeah. one of the things that I'm seeing is, seems like there's a bunch <coughs> of potential deals afoot if people will simply stop trying to think of things as being normal 
as we yeah. talked about earlier. So with that, we will uh, end this first segment and we will see everyone on the other side. Stand by. And welcome back to segment two of today's episode of the Nexus Nextcast. In the first segment, we talked about the political activities and events that are currently going on that we're seeing way too much of and uh, trying to sort our way through as we see people trying to take a curated narrative and trying to get people to think in a certain way about what is going on. And we contrasted that with what we're seeing in the charts as it relates to not only Trump himself, but specifically in the activities of the current impeachment inquiry, which in and of itself is an interesting term that is, again, a part of the curated narrative to drive people to think a certain way. But during the break, Jeff and I were talking about the aspects of astrology and astronomy. And one of the things that, that both of us find extremely interesting is the way in which people so easily discount what astrology actually is. So we want to spend a couple of minutes about how science, i.e. astronomy, and astrology are actually connected in at least the current way in which our physics understanding defines them. And one of the things that I brought up during the, uh, the break was the fact that we have just recently been given information about how the Voyager uh, uh, planetary probes have now reached the heliopause. And some of the data that they've now brought back and said, well, gee, we found out that not only is there this heliopause, which is essentially a bow wave shock of the sun moving through the galactic plane and the energy of that sun of our sun creating this this energetic electromagnetic field that is way out beyond our planets that are within the solar system and how the voyager one and two have found that not only is there this heliopause this which is all theoretical in the physics model but that there is a boundary layer and that they have found that some of the energy from the sun is actually poking through this boundary of electromagnetic energy. And they've also found that there is something that they have, are describing as a fire outside of this heliopause. In other words, they have found a heat signature that they didn't expect. All of this is related to how planets and our sun have energy. This energy is something that has been detected by the tools and toys that we've come up with based on current physics models that have defined the way in which these planets and things actually exist and what they have. Jupiter's got its own signature. You can look at things like the, uh, the, the music of the spheres, the song of the planets. Each planet has its own resonant frequency that can be picked up and turned into something that with our five cents 
uh, three-dimensional world that we exist in our in our carbon-based consciousness can now look at and say, hmm, I didn't know that Saturn sounded like that. I didn't hmm. know that Jupiter had this electromagnetic properties, that the moons themselves have their own electromagnetic properties. And in some way, it seems to me at least that this is one of the ways in which astrology can be related to for those who think that it's some kind of pseudoscience or some kind of nefarious uh, crafted stories of characteristics of planets. At the, at the minimum, they all have an electromagnetic signature. They all have some characteristic that makes them who and what they are. And in, to me, this gives some credence to the whole concept of astrology, in that astrology is about the energy of the planets and of the stars and the heavens and the way that they inter are individually and the way that they interact. What are your thoughts on that, Jeff? Well, you know, <clears throat> that's it's an interesting bunch of points that you just brought up. I, I would have to start with, <clears throat> when I look at myself, um, I, I go back to the mid-70s with my mother. And I actually thought my mother was nuts when she started talking about astrology because, you know, I'm a very practical person. You have to remember, I grew up like in the Dukes of Hazard, you know, cutting down trees, driving semis, uh, you know, logging up in the woods in northern Wisconsin near the upper peninsula of Michigan. And my life was just a real linear left brain kind of guy life, you know. <clears throat> Once you got past motorcycles, snowmobiles, and horses, I pretty much didn't think too much. So That's why you go, and I get along so well. Yeah, there, we, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, you know, it's and I, I, I think it's great, and I appreciate what you just said. Um, and I was very much involved in electronics and physics and acoustics, and still am most of my life. And I really honor that, and I've done forensics work. And I have to say, I never and still don't hold a torch for astrology I, because there are some people, and, and this gets into psychology, some people you will never, it's like Trump. Trump is the same analogy. You're never going to get them to like Trump. Forget it. You're never going to get them to believe in astrology. Forget it. It's not going to happen. They mm -hmm. will rationalize that away, not only in this lifetime, but probably the next lifetime. So, you know, it, what, to me, I was just this aloof, objective observer. I came in and say, okay, all right, fine. How did you know this about my girlfriend? I'm talking to my mother. And she would show me. And I'd, I mean, come on, the gravity and the planets is not going to affect anything. And then she would say, well, before you debunk it, just take a look at it. And I respected my mother. My mother was very intelligent. She was almost a doctor. She was an RN nurse, very intelligent. At her funeral, hundreds of people showed up in a town that has, I think, about 280 people. So everybody loved her, and she was really smart. And I said, okay, if she's checking this out, I'm going to check it out. And that's 40-something years ago. And I have to say, my objective kind of aloof scientific viewpoint of it is it's very accurate. And belief is not required. In fact, half the, the businessmen, you know, I just, I, I, I can't tell you, every single day I'm getting calls from someone. I just had a call from an individual this morning uh, on the other side of the world who said to me, I think I'm going to get extricated from the country. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, I... Um, I submitted my visa application. He's over there doing a, a big project. I can't mention what it is because I have to keep plan confidentiality. And he said, what do you think the consulate's going to say? And I said, well, I don't know. Well, let's cast a chart and see. So I cast the chart, right? Because he's calling his attorney. He says, attorney, well, you know, you've got to submit that documentation and blah, blah, blah. And so he calls me. Okay, and this is a guy who I don't want to mention any names, but but very intelligent, working with some very intelligent people. So, long story short, I cast the chart and I said, "Looks like Mercury retrograde screwed this up. They're probably going to need more documentation. They're not just going to grant it." But I said, "I think you'll get it done, and I think it's going to happen probably about the end of the month." Okay, now how would I know that? Okay, I look at the chart. I look at the geometry. The querent, who's on the other side of the planet, is the eastern horizon okay this is the way you do it just like an astro uh, just like a an electrician will say how much current is in this wire you get a voltmeter right and, and, and an ammeter and you measure the amperage it's very similar to that so 
How would I know that? I looked at his signifactor. The government is the 10th house in his case. And those of, or in power and authority over you was making an aspect and it was Mercury that's just now about the station and go direct. I knew all the paperwork got screwed up. So I sent him the email. And because he's out of communication, so he has to get to a place. He's in a remote place. And long story short, I get the email back literally 10 minutes before I got on, on the show with you. And what does it say? Well, Jeff, I can't believe it. You were right on. Uh, the, the, the consulate said they needed more clarification. and I have to get some paperwork back from, you know, blah, blah, blah over here in the United States. And looks like everything will be fine once I submit that and I'll get it. Now, there you go. So now the skeptical come along and say, well, wait a minute. How can you prove that? Can you do that again? No, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't make him apply for his visa again. I cannot make him have this situation again. It's like when you look at astrology, some people react very very intensely to their tra transits and progressions. Other people don't as much. It's because of who they are. You know, everyone is a resonant being. And I think when you, what I loved about what you said earlier is, yes, scientists can look at all the various physical and physics properties that we know of right now, which by the way, I might add, isn't much because mm -hmm. any honest physicist will tell you, I used to teach a physics class at a, at a college and I was always kind of struck with how myopic it looks at every subject. It's like law. It takes everything. It's like a legal case. It takes everything in isolation because it has to, because it can only address that issue at a time. It's, it's like trying to watch, you know, a centipede cross a road. It just has to do it in its own way, in its own time, in its own, you know, uh, capability. So that's the way you're limited when you start trying to analyze creation. And I always say you have to throw in, I really believe what, this whole system supports, no matter what anyone's faith is, whether you're Christian, you're Jewish, you're Muslim, you're Hindu, you've got to add the equation of divinity in there. And you have to. And to the atheists, I say, too bad. You don't like me? Screw you. Then go be an atheist. I don't care. God bless you, by the way. But uh, I would say, if you don't put in that this is a, that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience and that we are living in an interactive consciousness with the cosmos, if you will, it all dries up and blows away because well, it's not just a bunch of three dimensional matter. Well, and, and doesn't that, that get down to, you know, what we've talked about before on previous shows where there is consciousness is the one thing that in the entire, uh, across all disciplines of science, it has zero, uh, th there's nothing that any of the scientists, none of the individual knowledge domains and, and disciplines have come up with that defines this, this magical thing called consciousness, which they enables can. all yeah. of the other observational stuff that we, uh, that we encounter, that we consider, right. and that we look at. So consciousness is, is that one thing that, at least from an astrological perspective, and in some different disciplines of, of theologies and, and philosophies throughout time, have addressed and have given us some insight into. And mm -hmm. at this point, those are the most uh, reliable and definable ones that we can look at as it relates to trying to understand what is this thing called consciousness. And it's got this long, <coughs> long history of of being looked at and analyzed and thought about and downloaded by different civilizations, different thinkers, different entities. And you, know, you go ahead and throw in the interdimensional beings, whatever they may be and, 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 and whatever constitutes their part of this consciousness. But sure, let's sure. try to make this six pack simple. If I look at what we just talked about, and then, then we'll get into these other aspects of what we see going forward. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we have those markers uh, on the show, so that when these things unfold coming going forward, we can say, now you want to go back and revisit your belief or non belief in astrology. Take a yeah, look. Yeah, I'm that. not here to convince anybody because yeah. you never you never will. And never there's will, many but, people very resistant to it, and there's many and, people and that's who love fine. It, and and you know. for a lot of people, it's just not their time to yeah, be in a place where fine. they can address and and consider some of these things. But let's make it six pack simple. When I look at your charts, and, and I've been a purveyor of your work and, and, and a mastery of the craft for many years now, mm -hmm. so I personally am someone who has empirical data 
that is object objectively accurate because I have lived it. I've seen it. When I look at your charts and you cast the, the charts and we look at, there's three or four of them in particular that really give the, the insight of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, I look at that as uh, similar to being in an airplane or in a car and I have a dashboard in front of me. I've got a fuel indicator. I've got a speed indicator. It's I've got an a, energetic indicator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to me, the charts that are, that you use in, in Vedic astrology and Jyotish astrology and the way in which that information has been accumulated and analyzed and, and refined for millennia is really a dashboard to the energy of the cosmos. And if you can, it's like you said, it, belief is not required. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, you don't have to believe your speedometer is right at 65. You know, I mean, if, it's, if that's what it says, that's what it says. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and if you no, believed 85 guy, was good, then you know, the guy sitting the behind that billboard <laughs> that, you know, is sitting there with a radar gun, yeah. he's going to tell you whether your speedometer was, is accurate or not. So yeah. I think to that point, I think you can spend the end of time trying to validate astrology to people. It's <laughs> well, not for matter. me, there's believers and non-believers. It's the way. Yeah, it is. for me, I look at it and say, look, here's the analogy: you've got the physics, you've got the science, you've mm -hmm. got planets with energies, you've got all these different spectral analysis of from light waves to electromagnetic waves that we use in science today to mm -hmm. define and, and read things. Sure. It's astrology and these charts and the way that they're understood and they're looked at is the analogy to me. If you, if you don't believe in, if you believe in science and yet you can't see the correlation with astrology and the way in which the empirical data actually plays itself out, then that's, that's your choice and you can choose not to believe or even consider, but that doesn't take anything away from the fact that empirically it is what it is, and it is accurate. So, to that point, what do we see in 2020 about mm -hmm. some of these things that are going on uh, that I think are, are you know, we, we talked about Trump in the first segment and how profound, and we, it seems as though this man has been, he's been appointed, anointed, and he is sitting and in, at the threshold of doing what he's supposed to do, just like so many other people that have come throughout history uh, have, have apparently been through some of the same iterations. But let's yeah, talk yeah. about something like, um, you know, one of the things that, that is uh, starting to get even more and more uh, noise, chatter, um, and, and interest is this whole crypto asset thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The ways in which, and, and I look at this, I see both a technological and an economic aspect to the way that this is being rolled out, if you will, the way it's being unfolded. And I think that, you know, when you look at the, the global economy and the way in which the, I mean, you, you hear this, there's a cycle. It's every eight to 12 years. Oh, we're going to have a crash. We're going to have a recession. We're going to have, you know, some cyclical event from an economic perspective. And you see the stock markets that, you know, I mean, we've got more records. We're hitting records just about every day. You're seeing, uh, at least from the economic metrics that are used in the United States as it relates to our economy, numbers that have never, haven't been seen in decades, in some cases never before. So we're seeing this massive amount of activity, at least in the United States, seems to be bleeding over into other countries what do we see from an economic perspective going into 2020? And, and is there anything is there, that relates to this January 12th uh, conjunction that may have some impact on that? It, it's a trigger. It's a trigger. You know, I've been looking at this, and this one is a tough one to call. The indicators are the Saturn-Pluto always is what we call a trigger. Something happens in and around that time that that brings a trigger i've heard all kinds of things every financial speculator out there is got their theories or the internet is full of videos and they're all saying oh it's going to be this is going to be that i i think there is going to be some type of a reset from what i can see there has to be from all the indicators what i can tell you by what the charts say <clears throat> is every time these two mix up 
there is colossal changes. It's major regime change. The last time it really happened, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a combination of cryptos or gold. And I think there's a reason that the owners have Trump in there right now. Not that he didn't want to get in, but I think that's what they want in. Because believe me, if they didn't want him in there, he'd get a JFK haircut. Right. And they could certainly cause that one. Mm -hmm. um, and you, re you know, I remember that one. Um, <laughs> and and <laughs> they, they gave him a haircut. Yeah. And um, I think every president gets to see that. And wh what I think is, is the natural, and this has been something many people have been talking about. There's all kinds of scenarios like SDRs combined with crypto blockchain, which is really what crypto is. It's blockchain mm -hmm. uh, financing. And right. I hear that that's what they're up to. Something really big is on the horizon. I think this trade deal with China, you got, everyone has to remember, if you go back, China was floating our debt. They were buying all our derivatives. They, they were the mainstay. I hear, I hear all kinds of scenarios that Japan may have stepped in there very heavily right now, which is probably true. Um, and I think what's going on is the game is changing. This is why the United States is for the first time in over half of a century opening up steel mills. We're opening up all the natural resources. Um, and, and basically, it's reignite the country. Let's quit living off the, you know, 10 cent an hour or 20 cent an hour uh, people in rice paddies and living in flea bitten cages to buy things. And we're now reigniting the industrial might of this country as well as interacting with uh, the whole North American, you know, Mexican uh, Canadian deal. So all of that. That, you know, again, it's hard to tie the intricacies of every little detail to astrology. What I think the astrology gives us exactly, though, is something is happening right now that is absolutely colossal. And the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that's coming in on the winter solstice, and I've been saying this for years, you know, again, I'll, I'll re-say it again, or I'll reiterate it. Um, people said to me years ago, what do you think of the Mayan calendar? Not much. I, I don't think it's going to do a damn thing, and it didn't. Mm -hmm. Remember all the people, I mean, millions of dollars and you know, ammunition holes and, and, and food was bought on the Mayan calendar. Not a single thing happened. This, I really think, is going to change our world. I think our future is, you know, time marches on always, but then there's trigger points. And the, this is clearly a trigger point. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see the whole economic structures globally be changed somewhere in and around this January or shortly before, shortly thereafter. And I would also say uh, following close on the heels <clears throat> is the incredibly powerful Jupiter Saturn conjunction. Now, a lot of astrologers will say, yeah, but that happens every 20 years. Well, that's true. But this is happening in a tropical zodiac. The Sidereal one actually just happened back in September. But this, this is happening in a tropical zodiac in the air sign of Aquarius, and it shouldn't be confused with the Aquarian age, because I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that this tr is a trigger point when Jupiter and Saturn joined. It actually makes what we call a hexagram or a star of David, if you will, in the patterns throughout what we call the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And even though science balks at those as the creational elements, when you step back and talk to a quantum physicist, they kind of agree. They said, well, you know, there seems to be big categories of things we can lump everything into. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is this is a technology revolution. And there's no question AI, high tech is going to hit us like a freight train. It already has. I mean, that's the same thing that happened back in the industrial revolution. It didn't just happen. People were playing around with electricity and steam and new manufacturing methods. And we, we didn't just have Henry Ford come out with the Model T. I mean, a lot of people a lot of folks are out there playing around with the internal combustion engine and steam and manufacturing and all the machining stuff that made the Industrial Revolution possible. Just like now, when you look at the infrastructure that's in with all the computing systems, the hardware, the software, the, I mean, it's colossal. I mean, mm -hmm. we're more positioned for this kind of an environment than ever before. I think we're going to see electronic currencies come in. Again, I'll say flying cars, explosions in genetics, miraculous changes in the future. The, the thing that I see in terms of uh, there could be really the thing that could throw a wrench 
and alter it. And, and I think we're going to see a lot of earth changes. I keep seeing so much in the charts that would indicate that we're going to see more volcanic activity, which could equal uh, seismic activity and very erratic weather patterns. I think the people at the grand solar minimum are right. I think mm -hmm. it isn't your SUV or the cows farting. I think it is the sun that's affecting climate change. And I think mm -hmm. climate change, we're in what we call a grand solar minimum. Mm -hmm. And the, I was on their radio show. They're going to put it out one of these days. But um, it, it's really, I think, some great scientific research that proves that climate change is affected by the sun. It's not yes. affected. In fact, the CO2, from all the data I've heard from some really smart people, indicates that part of the global ice melting, maybe volcanic activity up near the poles that's affecting. Well, yeah, and, and in fact, they've, uh, there's been some recent scientific uh, papers that uh, NASA's even put out where they have found that the melting in Antarctica and some of the, the shelving that's occurring is coming from heat that's underneath the continent from volcanic activity, not CO2, not right. methane. Exactly. In fact, exactly I, I've been on this bandwagon right. for, for about yep. 12 years. I think I've, I'm exactly close, right. close to about three or four And this is hard science. This is hard yeah, science. And, yeah, and, you know, and, and, and again, this measure. goes back to what we were talking about earlier in this curated narrative. Right. There is a, there's a, a, a reason that the owners have tried to create a distraction and therefore uh, inject – uh, of a, a thought, a group think, and a meme that makes people think one way, right, which is right. exactly the opposite of what's going on in reality. And I think that climate well, change. Well, I think it's globalism. Globalism versus uh, nationalism is what's happening. And mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting when you look at this whole situation, a lot of people have heard about George Soros. It's the people behind Soros. Uh, there right. is always these factions that seem to be battling behind the scenes that are, are really influencing and they're doing it all through money. And um, it's very mysterious what's all behind there. It almost gets um, <laughs> in a realm that um, <coughs> is outside of logical analysis. It's almost mm -hmm. kind of faded on the human race's destiny, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, when you look at what happened in World War One and World War Two, and the power structures that got formed, taken apart and reformed, it's amazing. And those power structures are still there. And again, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that's happening in January, this is when empires rise and fall. And, and I really think that's what we're seeing here is the it's different than the old world. We're seeing the structures, the empiric structures that are really running things behind the scenes are, are being rearranged. And yeah. I think that's falling and a new one's being put in place. And, and the peop people that run it are, are going to maintain control. And, and I think the ones that are behind Trump are the ones that are going to win. And so now to your point about <coughs> empires rising and falling, hmm. my sense, and you know, tell me your thoughts on this. My sense is, uh, and this has nothing to do necessarily from a political ideology perspective, it's just from an observationalist perspective. During the Obama years, it felt like we were like the United States as a world power, as an entity that had the influence that it had had, had for decades uh, mm -hmm. before, kind of got soft. It, it yeah, was it it get kind of soft. It did get soft. Yeah. It, when he yeah, gutted yeah, the military. I was being generous. I was being generous. He gutted the military from what I've heard. Well, not only that, but I mean, he's, you know, you, this the crazy hypocrisy of you know, Trump holding back a few hundred million dollars for the Ukraine for security, and yep. yet Obumble is going over and dumping 150 billion dollars off a, on on pallet loads of cash to yeah, right. uh, 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 Iran. And I'm going, excuse me, um, but anyway, um, it seems to me right now, and and this is relates to this empire's rise and fall. China has been something that's been growing for decades, right? Huge, yep, you bet. Right? And the United dangerous. States during very Obama dangerous. has had this so this weakening, this softening. Mm -hmm. It almost seems to me like the reverse is happening right now. Well, that's, that's what I'm States saying. Is this is the globalists versus the nationalists. 
Yeah, the United States is growing in strength, and China is starting to weaken a little bit. Does that make any sense to you? Do you see that? Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. I, I think what you're seeing there is the globalists are trying to regain power. They want everyone on health care. They want everyone standing in line, getting a check from the government, and everyone it's basically communism and that's what they want. Socialism yeah. is communism. And right. it, it was interesting, you know, again, love them or hate them to see Trump say this country will never be a socialist country. Mm -hmm. um, and believe me, they're trying, they're really, really trying. The thing that scares me in the future <clears throat> is right now, I think Trump's going to get back in. That's what the charts indicate. What, what worries me is 10, 20 years from now. Uh, and I, I hate to echo George again, but Carlin was right. They're going to get this place. They're going to get it all from you because they own it. And right now we're seeing the ebbs and the flows and in, in the way it's all being done. But 10, 20 years from now, the young people better wake up because I'm going to tell you, they're getting programmed in these colleges. They're getting so mind controlled. Sooner or later, if you give your power over to these programs and just say, oh, they're going to take care of me, we're done. I mean, human freedom will be done. And the futuristic outlook, when you look at Blade Runner and all these amazing movies that, that have been made about the future, Terminator and so many others, they all have this bleak outlook of human spirit being suppressed by machines over the very systems they create. And that's our nature. And I think, in a way, God kind of throws a curveball with, with the, um, the natural disasters mm -hmm. and the disruptions in this. There's so many souls having experiences here. We are not machines. We're never going to be machines. And I think that's what kills us. I think that's what shortens our lives is we're so mechanistic with our computers and our cars and our, our just entirely dependent mechanistic society. I mean, when you look out the window and watch a bird land on a wire or a branch and you look at nature, nature's natural. It's, it's divine. Um, I go up in Franklin Canyon uh, every now and then for a hike. Um, for anybody who wants to know, if you watch the Andy Griffith show and little Opie is throwing a rock, that's called Myers Lake in mm -hmm. the middle of Beverly Hills, believe it or not. Um, and it's uh, where, where, where the opening of Andy Griffith's show was filmed. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's interesting because I recognized it years ago and I said, oh my God, this is where that happened. But it, it's so nice to get out and center ourselves. And I think with this technology coming in in the future, if we don't have some way to center ourselves, like just, just this morning, some other maniac is shooting a bunch of kids at a school. This is why we see the insanity in the world is because the human race has always been certifiable in one sense and divine in the other. And, and yeah. I think we have to find a way to keep ourselves centered. And again, when I look at astrology, I would walk away from astrology except for one thing. And that is, I always am so rewarded when someone says to me, you know, that really gave me direction. It gave me insight. It gave me a way to know that, my God, this is hard right now, but it's, it's, it gives me faith in myself or at least that I'm going to get through this somehow. Well, you know? it, it, gives, it gives perspective and hope and, and it gives insight to that which is because, like you said, uh, and, and of course, here we are at the end of the segment and we could go on this for another yeah, yeah, hour yeah. easily. But, you know, I, I, um, I, I want to say one thing really fast. I've yeah. been really blessed most of my life to be around a lot of different religions. I've worked with Mother Teresa. I've worked with all kinds of people in, mm -hmm. in the uh, rabbinical community and the Christian community. And I have to say, in the Hindu community as well and Muslim. And one of the ubiquitous thing that I find that's common in all of them, and that is a belief and a faith in a higher power. And, you know, I don't want to preach here, but I, that's what I find with astrology is you can't put your faith in just astrology. You use it as the guide. I call it the eagle. It gets us up there. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's, it's up to us. And the free will is why the astrology actually works. It's an interactive free will here. It's an interactive <clears throat> that's right. consciousness. That's right. It, it's an interactive consciousness. It really is. And we do have free will. I don't believe astrology predicts the future, I, it, even though it acts like it. Like this morning, the guy, the, the example, every day I get an example, wow, it looks like it just was right on. It is because it's showing where the interactive consciousness is.
Right. Well, <laughs> Jeff, uh, we're at the end of this right. segment, end of the show. And um, again, just mind-blowing, amazing stuff. Oh, wow. A marker has been placed, and we will be able to check the future in the yeah, future. Let's see what happens. Let's and see what see happens. What happens. Yeah. Uh, what, please tell everybody how they can find you and your services to get more information about the interactive consciousness that they need to know about. Well, uh, Jeff at jeffharman.com. That's Jeff at J-E-F-F-H-A-R-M-A-N.com. And thanks for having me, Robert. It's always a uh, pleasure. It's always an adventure. It's always a pleasure. And it's always something that I can't get enough of and always look forward to (laughs) each and every time. It's fun. So thank you again, Mr. Harman. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, we will see everyone on the next episode of the Nexus Next Cast. Thank you very much for joining us on today's episode. Make sure that you mark this down and check in down the road because you'll find out that empirical data is much better than hearsay or somebody's curated narrative because there's more than enough of that to go around that the empirical data is what makes a difference. We are all one and many and many and one. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us today on the Nexus NextCast. If you find this information and this show valuable, please share, like, and subscribe in all of the normal ways and fashions on the various platforms where you can find the Nexus NextCast. All links to the information provided during the show will be available in the description area below this video. And on the Nexus website, at bauer.media forward slash the nexus the nexus next cast is heard every tuesday and friday on the odyssey radio network at 11 p.m eastern time until next time remember that we are all one in many and many in one live accordingly and do your best to be a positive influence on yourself and the world around you